Thank you for that introduction and for the chance to be here today. I'm very excited to join you guys, especially after a couple years of seeing your names and faces as small boxes on Zoom. I'm looking forward to talking in person. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the diversity, biology, and history of psilocybin-containing fungi, starting with some vocabulary. So this is a mushroom. It's also known as a fruiting body. And fruiting body, like a fruit, is accurate because it produces seeds, spores, which act like seeds. Um, but I want you to keep in mind that mushrooms, or fungi, belong to their own kingdom, and they're not actually plants at all. From mushrooms come spores, which are microscopic. We need microscopes to see them to our eyes. They look like dust. And those spores go out into the world and then later germinate into hyphae, or mycelia. You could think of this as the body of the mushroom. So a mushroom is actually a reproductive structure, and this is like the tree living underground. So spores come from mushrooms, they germinate into hyphae, and then later the hyphae converge back to form a mushroom in the right conditions. The hyphae go on, and here we have a simplified life cycle where spores come from mushrooms, make hyphae, and the hyphae go back on to, to make mushrooms. Now, when it comes to fungal identification, we use a suite of characters, including how these fungi look and what color their spores are, including a spore print, and Michelle is going to talk a lot about that in just a moment. And then as modern mycologists, we also use DNA, or gene and genome sequencing. And the DNA of fungi or mushrooms holds all of its secrets, from what its favorite foods are, to who its sisters and brothers and cousins are, to the evolutionary selective pressures that have made it look the way that it does. So here are three closely related psilocybe species, and I just want to differentiate. Psilocybin or psilocin are the molecules. Psilocybe is the genus of the fungi that make them. And when we sequence genes or genomes of these organisms, we can use that information to determine how closely related they are. One gene that we use frequently is rDNA, or the ITS, this intron in ribosomal DNA. And that's what I'm showing you on the bottom right. So in this diagram, let's see if I can get a pointer. Each one of these lines is an individual gene sequence from a mushroom. And at the top, what you're seeing is a consensus of how similar they are, where purple regions are less similar and pink regions are more similar. So using these similarity analyses or alignments, we can build phylogenetic assays and essentially infer who's related to who, where these mushrooms are from, and where they've moved over the course of their history. Fungal genome sequencing has also allowed us to understand and develop new medicines, including uh, making psilocybin in vitro. And here I'm showing you the Psi gene cluster. These, these genes have names that start with PSI for psilocybin biosynthesis. I want to point out this is work from the lab of uh, Frick et al. in a paper from uh, 2017. And here what we see are these colored beads on a string. These are our genes, and the string is the background genome. So the gene names, which are colored here, correspond to genes in this gene cluster. And they're physically clustered because they contribute to an iterative process of, of creating psilocybin. If we take these genes and layer them onto the biosynthetic pathway, and this is also work that came from the Frick et al. paper, but it's recreated in a review, an open access review paper in the journal Fungal Biology from my lab group. So if we take those genes and layer them onto the biosynthetic pathway, we can see that inside of hyphae, fungi start with the amino acid tryptophan and through a series of biochemical modifications make psilocybin and then psilocin. The knowledge of this pathway has helped us not only understand how to make psilocybin in vitro, and that's been the basis for a lot of the wonderful clinical trial data that we've heard about so far, but it's also enabled discovery uh, using bioinformatic tools of other fungi that are capable of producing psilocybin. And Michelle's going to talk about that now. Thank you, Dr. Hewling. OK. Say you found a mushroom. How do you go about identifying it? Let's start at the top with the cap. What is the color of the cap, and does it have any texture? Moving down, looking at the veil, does it remain attached in the form of a skirt or an annulus? Does your mushroom have pores, or does it have gills? 
And looking at the stipe, do you have a swelling at the base or a cup at the base known as a vulva? Another really important distinctive feature for mushroom identification is looking at the, the spore color. And we do this by taking what's called a spore print. To take a spore print, you cut off the, the top of the cap, then you place the fertile surface uh, facing down, and you allow the spores to deposit for about 24 hours. And after 24 hours, you have this beautiful piece of, piece of art um, that can tell you what the color of the spore print is. Using these um, features can help you differentiate psilocybin-producing species from some of their deadly, deadly lookalikes. So these are the species of psilocybin-producing fungi we have here in North America. Next to these colored bars, you're going to notice a lot of similar names, and that's because the colored bars, the colored bars largely correspond to different genera. Um, and a genus is kind of like a cousin, whereas the names within each of these colored bars um, are, are different species in that genus. And you can kind of think of like a species as, as a sibling. Um, and so what you'll see is we have over 60 species of psilocybin-producing mushrooms here in North America. And here in the Pacific Northwest, we have 24 of those, representing at least six genera. And so today, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about those genera and where they can be found. So psilocybin-producing mushrooms can be found on fruiting from a wide range of substrates. In North America, you can find them commonly in landscape mulch, uh, fruiting from ungulate dung in oak forests, uh, fruiting from turf grass, from coniferous rainforests, and also uh, along the beach in the beach grass. So using the power of iNaturalist citizen scientist observations, we can actually map where these psilocybin-containing fungi occur. Um, so what you're looking at here, this is a map of the distribution of the psilocybin-containing fungi in the genus Gymnopolis. And what you can see is there's a widespread distribution um, throughout North America for, this, uh, for, for these species. In Gymnopolis, we have over 60 species, but only 11 are known to produce psilocybin. And uh, the psilocybin-producing species are characterized by reddish-brown fruiting bodies, uh, reddish-brown to yellow fruiting bodies that are medium to large in size. Um, they're fruiting directly from wood because they're sapotrophic on wood. And you're usually going to be fall, uh, finding them in the fall months. And their common name, the rust gills, is derived from their rusty orange spore print. The, the next genus I'll talk about is another widespread psilocybin-producing species, and that is Paniolus. And here in North America, we have 22 species of Paniolus, but only seven are known to produce psilocybin. Paniolus is a saprotrophic fungus, and you can, you're usually going to find it like in the summer months when the animals are out to pasture or people are really uh, heavily irrigating their lawn because it likes to fruit directly from grass or, or dung. And the psilocybin-producing species um, in this genus have jet black spore prints. Next up is a lesser known genus that has psilocybin-containing species, and that is Pluteus. In North America, we have 65 species of Pluteus, but only five are known to produce psilocybin. So, uh, Pluteus species are saprotrophic fungi that also fruit directly from wood, and you're going to be finding these between spring and fall months here in North America. These are kind of like <laughs> large, nondescript mushrooms uh, with brown caps, typically, um, and they have free gills and these just absolutely gorgeous pink spore prints. Next up is the genus that perhaps you are, all are very familiar with, which is Psilocybe. Here in North America, we have 30 species of psilocybe, with centers of biodiversity uh, here in the Pacific Northwest and also in South Central Mexico. Psilocybe species fruit from a, a wide range of substrates, and you can find them all 12 months of the year. So essentially what they do is they follow where the climate is mild and the rainfall is plentiful. And it's really important that uh, when identifying a psilocybe species, you take a spore print, they have uh, purple-black spore prints, and then uh, they're usually small to medium size. They usually have like a caramel color cap. But um, other than that, they do have some differing uh, morphological features. So, what I'm, so the takeaway message is that psilocybin-producing fungi have different spatiotemporal patterns of fruiting, depending on the taxa. Generally speaking, most mushrooms favor mild temperatures and, and rainfall. 
Um, so right now, the screen is cycling through the, the major genera of that have psilocybin-producing species. And you'll see that each of these bars represent the accumulation of iNaturalist observations uh, for each of the respective genera. And what you'll see is some trends emerging that, um, you know, essentially where there's, the rainfall is good and, and, and the temperature is mild, we'll see uh, an increasing abundance of observations. So we see the, the greatest number of observations of psilocybin-producing fungi in, uh, in Mexico in, in the summer. You'll see it, and that's because of the subtropical storms. And then in the Pacific Northwest in the fall and winter months. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we have two dozen species of psilocybin-producing fungi. Though the ones that are primarily targeted for consumption are from the woodlovers group. A potential concern is that uh, the co-occurrence of a deadly look-alike species, which is known as Gallerina marginata, and it shares a lot of overlapping morphological features. So um, Gallerina margin marginata is in the lower right, and the other five tiles are the species from the woodlovers group. And you can see, at, at first glance, to a nervous collector, these look very similar. Um, but unfortunately, Gallerina marginata can kill you. Um, and unfortunately, they uh, fruit from the same substrate, so they're, they're all fruiting from wood, and they fruit at the same time. So um, that's potentially concerning. And this can be verified when looking at iNaturalist observation data. So just south of here, Corrales, any, anywhere you see a red dot overlapping with any other color dot is the co-occurrence of this deadly species and the species from this wood livers group. And the story is the same here in Portland, too. So while there are uh, likely hundreds of psilocybin-producing taxa that occupy diverse ecological habitats and come in all shapes and sizes, the vast majority of mushrooms consumed from the gray market come from the subtropical dung-loving species, Psilocybe cubensis. So here's a uh, fungal tree of life showing all of the sequenced Psilocybe fungi. Um, just like a real tree, the longer and the <laughs> I don't have the, the laser. The longer the branches and the bushier uh, the node, the more early diverging the lineage. And what's really fascinating about Psilocybe cubensis is, in spite of having these diverse chemotypes and phenotypes that we see with these strains, at the DNA barcoding level, level they're, they're genetically indistinguishable. So this uh, purple clade here at the bottom represents over 70, spe uh, 70 strains of Psilocybe cubensis. And you can see that the terminal node is flat, which means the ITS region is identical. If I can divert your attention to the, oops, <laughs> if I can uh, divert your attention to the, the top of the, the clade here, you're going to see a lot more structure, and that's because this represents more of the, the global diversity that we see, and that uh, Jesse will talk about. Thank you. So. What I'd like to do with the ending portion of this talk is describe a little bit of the diversity in global psilocybin product and species usage by highlighting what's happening in a few countries and states. And then we'll go into a little bit of the ethnomycological history before we close. So this is by no means a comprehensive list, and it also does not cover the amazing clinical trial data research that's been done with synthetic psilocybin. But just by way of example, what's happening around the world? Well, here in Oregon, we're focused on cultivating um, varieties of Psilocybe cubensis. And if you're interested in hearing more mycological logic for these decisions, I encourage you to join Athira Boss, Angie Albi, and myself tomorrow morning in the Psilocybin in Oregon uh, section. And we're going to be making mushrooms, hyphae, natural uh, psilocybin extracts, and edible products containing these. In contrast, in the Netherlands, there's a consumption happening of truffles, or sclerotia. These aren't true truffles in the mycological sense, but nonetheless, these balls of hyphae contain psilocybin, and they're cultivated from psilocybe tamponensis in Mexicana. Down in Jamaica, there's a number of high-quality resorts offering edibles, including mushrooms and whole mushroom products, again from psilocybe cubensis varieties. 
And in Canada, um, in addition to Psilocybe cubensis, they're investigating Penelis cyanescens, so a fair amount of diversity here. So I think you're seeing a trend that it's mostly Psilocybe cubensis, as Michelle said, and a few other specimens. But by far, the most diverse um, set of Psilocybe species that's, that grows and that is consumed is in Mexico. And this reflects the center and potentially the center of origin and diversity for this genus, and also the thousands of years long mycological history. So you can see here there's over a dozen species that occur in Mexico, and they're thought to be endemic, which means that many of them don't exist in other locations. This is in contrast to Psilocybe cubensis and Tampanensis, for example, which have large geographic range and also occur in parts of the United States, Florida. Um, here's a timeline. So usually when we talk about the development of psilocybin therapies, we'll start here in the current moment where we've had 10 plus years of increased uh, data generation in, in psilocybin and psychedelic research. And of course now the new developments in Oregon, which are very exciting. And this is a welcome change, as we all know, from the 70s and 80s, when the federal policy shifts essentially brought psychedelic research to a screeching halt. Um, but usually we start this story in the 1950s when uh, Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson worked on one species that they obtained from one woman in Mexico. And that woman, of course, was Maria Sabina, who in my opinion often does not get the credit that she deserves. And what's more is that she's one woman who gave them one fungal species, and she was from one culture, from the Mazatec culture. Um, the true timeline, as we know, looks something like this. There's thousands of years of history of, of these peoples and cultures using dozens of species. And this is evidenced by archaeological data and also by the Vindo Cotabonensis. And I think most profoundly by the complexity of the mycological knowledge in the descendants and peoples of these groups. And so my charge to all of us is when we tell this story to be accurate, to spend equal if not proportionate time on the, the full history and say the names of the people who use these medicines. Know where they lived. Know that it's dozens of species, not just one, and dozens of cultures. Oop. Sorry. So here I'm showing you a map of the current indigenous territories in the country of Mexico. So there are over 200 indigenous groups on this map, and this is data from the Native Land Digital. Uh, which I encourage you to check out if you have not. So most of the species and, and peoples I just mentioned are from central Mexico, but I note that a lot of these species are widely distributed across the country and as well as the archaeological evidence suggesting these practices are very ancient. A few words on the Nagoya Protocol. So this is an international agreement that was signed by many countries and it essentially necessitates the compensation of peoples and knowledge sources. And uh, the goal was to avoid pirate biopiracy and enable conservation. And so I'm very encouraged by the efforts that I've just heard about this morning at UC Berkeley, and I think that's spot on. We need to think about how to uh, compensate these the peoples where these genetic resources are from. So in summary, there are hundreds of psilocybin producing species. Magic mushrooms are not simply one organism. Um, but most of the cultivation and consumption that we see comes from just a few species and primarily from Psilocybe cubensis. Uh, there's a diversity of psilocybin producing species that have been consumed for a long, long time in Central and South America, and it's important to share the history of that story really accurately. And then lastly, modern genetic tools and genome sequencing can really help us unravel the secrets of psilocybin production and also find other uh, co-residing potentially bioactive secondary metabolites. And with that, I want to give a few acknowledgments. So I have our, our co-author team for the review article in fungal biology, uh, the folks whose photos we used, and a link to the Oregon psilocybin website um, with the rapid evidence review, which is another high quality review paper that summarizes a lot of the primary literature and clinical trials that you've heard about today. And as well, I put my contact information. So I'm very interested in starting and establishing a, a research center, hopefully based in Eugene. And if you're interested in partnering in that endeavor, please come find me and chat with me. So thank you very much for your attention and we'd be happy to take questions.
Thank you, Dr. Yuling and Michelle. We have about, we have 20 minutes for question and answer. Is that accurate? 20? I think Paul's at noon. I, that's what I thought, but we will ask some questions. <laughs> um, so this area of research is definitely not my um, area of expertise, so it was a lot to learn that there are, I mean, I know that there are whoop, so many different species of psilocybin-containing mushrooms, and um, it's a bit overwhelming to, to see them all mapped out, and I really like what you said about um, learning the names and where they came from and the cultures that use them, and um, really like having that in our vocabulary when we're speaking about um, these mushrooms. I'm curious if either of you have any concerns regarding harm to any specific species of mushroom uh, due to increasing interest in the psilocybin industry and um, you know people wanting to go out and, and find mushrooms and are there things that we can do to reduce the risk of harm to the mushroom? Um, go for it. So um, the way that mushrooms, um, as Jesse went over in the life cycle, when we see a fruiting body um, from a fungus, it's actually kind of like the analogy that we often use in mycology, it's like the apple on the tree. The majority of the fungus is actually underground in these mycelial networks. Um, so, you know, when folks go out and they harvest mushrooms, there's this big debate whether you should, you know, pick or you should cut. Um, as long as you're not, like, doing a lot of uh, disturbance to that underground mycelial, mycelial networks, um, it shouldn't cause any, any harm. Of course, um, in order to reproduce, uh, in order to complete the fungal life cycle, it's, it's probably good practice, practice to let them uh, sporulate. Um, but other than that, it shouldn't be any, any major harm. Yeah, a lot of cultivation happens in lab settings, so from cultures that get preserved long term in freezers and things. And so from that perspective, I, I don't have concerns about uh, damaging um, like living organisms. I do think it's important to note that mycology as a field is quite a bit younger than the study of plants and animals. And so one um, issue that's troubling to me in the face of climate change among you know, the, the factors that we're discussing here is that we don't know for a lot of species the true distribution of their populations and how diverse they are in the first place. So studying biodiversity, finding new species, documenting them, understanding where they live and how they live is, is really important part of mycology. Great, thank you both so much. A couple more questions here. Um, Dr. Euling, I know you said you would address this tomorrow in the um, Oregon day, uh, but it is, I think, a, a common question, so it'd be nice for the audience to have a brief answer as to what the rationale is behind uh, restricting the Oregon Psilocybin Services Program to psilocybin uh, cabenzies. Um, and yeah, just any thoughts that you have about that in the short summary version? Yeah, so we're going to talk a lot about that tomorrow, but the short version is there's a long and, and rich history of consumption of this species, and it's mostly been safe from what we've seen. And as you saw, it's being consumed all around the world. We're actually very surprised when we did those genetic analyses and learned that a lot of the common isolates that we all know and love and their phallic names um, are actually cubensis. And so that's... Um, the basis for the logic of why to go solely with cubensis in the beginning. Other reasons are that there's enough um, genetic resources, gene sequences available in, in databases like NCBI's sequence database to accurately identify them. And that's really important from a consumer safety standpoint. So if you're gonna sequence something to figure out what it is, you have to have other sequences and databases to compare it to. And then the last reason is, you know, we're here in the Pacific Northwest, why not go with a wood lover? Those are local, they're endemic, and uh, we're hearing more accounts of the so-called wood lover's paralysis phenomenon. So f some folks apparently lose control of limbs for a short amount of time, and it comes back, but we don't understand scientifically the molecular mechanism for this phenomenon yet, and so we'd like to avoid it outright, at least initially. But that said, we're definitely you know, talking about how to increase species diversity later, and, and uh, we'd love to hear feedback on that concept. Great, thank you. Um, and one more. What's the difference between hyphae and mycelium? Interchangeable. Hyphae are mycelium. Great, that was a short one. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Um, let's see, are there differences between naturally occurring and homegrown mushrooms and indoor grown mushrooms? That's a great question. I haven't seen any uh, quantitative scientific data from a lab-based standpoint on that, but I'm, I'm sure that folks in the audience or people that we know have done similar studies. Um, I will say that many fungi, they're very sensitive creatures. They can sense gravity, light, CO2, sugars, amino acids. So, you know, growing in their native habitat in soil or wood in the forest versus growing on media in, the, in a lab setting or indoors is very different. And I would expect that large portions of the genome are differentially transcribed. So I think that's a, an awesome study that we need to do. And I, I will just say, too, that there's kind of a blurry line between homegrown and wildgrown because we're seeing more and more uh, movement of species that are driven by, uh, by humans. <laughs> uh, one example is we see uh, uh, Psilocybe ovoideo cystidiata here in the Pacific Northwest, and it, it wasn't previously known here, so uh, there's a blurry line between uh, homegrown and what's in the wild. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Great, well I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Um, this is a great harm reduction question, which I'm all about. Uh, when harvesting mushrooms for therapeutic use, how are we sure we're not administering the deadly mushroom? Yeah, so uh, this is where um, <laughs> accurate identification of your, your mushroom is, is really uh, critical. The, one of the deadly ones that we're most concerned about, which is the Gallerina marginata, has a, an orange, uh, it's a brown, brownish orange spore print. So this is where really taking that spore print is, is key, whereas the psilocybe wood lovers have that purplish black spore print. Um, of course, you can also look for the blue bruising, but uh, sometimes it, it looks like blue bruising on Gallerina when it's really blackish, so I really encourage people to take a spore print. That is the, the, the absolute best way other than looking at the DNA. And we've also built that into some of the policy development in the Oregon Solicitor psilocybin services model, so we're requiring DNA testing to speciate fungi before administration, um, so using PCR gene sequencing. Great, that's good to know, thank you. And I think that's all we have for today. Thank you both so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and for this wonderful presentation.